In the heart of Lancashire, where the sun dips low behind rolling hills and the air fills with the nostalgic scent of freshly cut grass, there lies a ground hallowed by time, struggle, and victory. Tonight, we delve into the intertwined history of Burnley Cricket Club and Burnley Football Club, both of whom call Turf Moor their home. To fully grasp the origins of these sports clubs and their establishment at Turf Moor, it's crucial to consider the larger historical context, the Industrial Revolution in England. Once a quaint market town, Burnley underwent a transformation into an industrial centre. Hundreds left their rural homes and small villages, attracted by the prospect of employment and economic opportunity as cotton mills began to dot the bucolic landscapes of East Lancashire. This industrial shift gave the working class something they hadn't had much of before. Leisure time. And what more fitting way to utilize this newfound freedom than through the camaraderie and competition of sports? Burnley Cricket Club began life as the Trafalgar Club and was probably made up of officers from the British Army units that were local to Burnley, the 59th Regiment of Foot and the 3rd Royal Lancashire Militia. The Trafalgar Club appears to have played its inaugural match in Bull Meadow in 1828, the very site where Hargreaves Street Central Methodist Church now stands in the town centre. The club was the brainchild of local personalities including John Stadders, Robert Wilson, John Holgate, George Holgate, Richard Eastwood, John Tattershall, among others. For a period, the club restricted its matches to its own members, fielding teams of 11 that were hand-picked by a pair of captains. After a brief tenure at Bull Meadow, the Trafalgar Club moved its base first to Stonyholme and then subsequently to Healy Heights, where they continued to play for an extended time. The earliest tangible evidence pointing to the inception of Burnley Cricket Club, an entity for which the Trafalgar Club was unquestionably a precursor, dates back to a circular letter from August 22, 1833, in which they make the claim to be Burnley Cricket Club. This name is not formally used again for another 11 years. After its time at Healy Heights, the club relocated to a meadow where the Red Lion Street is now located at a pub called the Albion Inn, adopting the name the Albion Club. From this point, the club's next move was to Greenhall's Gardens, situated near the old gasworks of the town. Then, in 1843, it made its inaugural move to the now famous Turf Moor. During this time, the term Burnley Cricket Club had only been used once. However, in 1844, the club solidified its identity by purchasing a canvas pavilion emblazoned with the words Burnley Cricket Club 1844. For the years 1845 and 1846, the club shifted its activities to Duke Bar, leaving turf more temporarily unused. A turning point came on December 16, 1846, during a meeting held at the Bull Inn on Manchester Road in Burnley. It was declared that there would be a concerted effort, led by Mr. A. Rothwell, to reclaim and resume playing at Turf Moor. During a later gathering, which once again took place at the Bull Inn, a momentous announcement was made that would tie the futures of both cricket and football in Burnley. Mr. Charles Sutcliffe was appointed as the chair of the club, then known as the Burnley Albion Cricket Club. Significantly, Mr. Sutcliffe was the father of another Charles Sutcliffe, who would later etch his name in the annals of British sports history as one of the founding players of Burnley Football Club. The senior Sutcliffe's leadership in the cricket club thus serves as a prelude to the younger Sutcliffe's future contributions to Burnley's sporting legacy, knitting together the intricate tapestry of athletics and community in Burnley. On the 23rd of April 1847, the committee decided that the following notice be painted on a board and placed against the building adjoining the cricket ground, notice, all persons found upon the cricket ground unless introduced by a member, will be considered as trespassers and proceeded against according to law. Five days later on April 28, 1847, the first game took place at Turf Moor. Wickets were to be pitched at 2.30pm and all players were to adjourn to the Bull Inn for a beefsteak supper at 8 that night. During this era, an interesting dynamic unfolded between the Albion Club and what was then known as Burnley Cricket Club. Though both entities existed somewhat independently, the Albion Club reached out to propose a cricket match. 
Burnley Cricket Club declined the offer, but extended a somewhat diplomatic response, suggesting they would have no objection to receive any of the Albion club members at the usual subscription, a sum of 10 shillings per annum at the time. This opens a window into the sporting culture of the era, where the lines between clubs were not as rigidly defined as they might be today. In a further nod to community integration, a request was also made for officers from Burnley Barracks to join the Burnley Cricket Club as honorary members. It's a subtle, but important, reflection of how sport was seen as a unifying element within the community, cutting across various societal spheres. Following 11 years of play at Turf Moor, the Burnley Cricket Club faced a decline and eventually dissolved in 1857. The vacuum was soon filled, however, when officers from the Burnley militia based at Clifton Barracks seized the opportunity to continue the cricketing tradition. They formed a new team and adopted the moniker Burnley Wellington Club. This newly formed entity competed against other local clubs, notably Preston and Blackburn. Their level of success elevated when they contracted John Bray, a well-regarded professional cricketer from Accrington. This gave the team an edge, symbolizing a shift toward more organized and competitive cricket in the region. However, by the end of the 1863 season, the Burnley Wellington Club was disbanded. Yet, it was far from the end of cricket in Burnley. The old Burnley Cricket Club was revived, demonstrating the enduring spirit of the game in the community. The cricketing saga in Burnley serves as a rich tapestry of local history, societal norms, and sporting evolution, and perhaps most importantly, it underscores the indomitable resilience of the community's love for the sport. In the decision to re-establish their presence at Turf Moor, the committee didn't just settle for reclaiming the land. They took a proactive step to memorialize the site's historical significance. They prepared a memorial to the Reverend W. Thursby and Colonel Scarlett, requesting the erection of a fence wall to demarcate the cricket ground from the road connecting Burnley to Brunshaw. Both of these men were pivotal figures in Burnley's history, with Reverend Thursby having been the previous owner of the Turf Moor land, as elaborated in the first video of this series. In 1864, a milestone was reached in Burnley's cricketing history, the club officially changed its name to the Burnley Cricket Club. The team boasted some exceptional talent, such as William Richmond, a local-born cricketer who once performed the remarkable feat of hitting a ball out of Turf Moor all the way to St. Mary's Church on Yorkshire Street. The club's committee, always eager to better the team and attract new talent, took an innovative step in 1866. They acquired a range of gymnasium equipment aimed at enhancing the player's physical fitness. Funding these ventures, along with other costs like ground improvements and professional player wages, which was set at 26 shillings a week, required resourcefulness. The solution came in the form of an athletic festival at Turf Moor, complete with valuable prizes in various field events to lure competitors. Marquees were set up, a band was engaged, and even a horse jumping event was arranged. The festival was a resounding success and became an annual affair for over two decades. However, there were always concerns about the financial risks, particularly if the weather turned sour. In a landmark event from 9th to 11th of July 1868, George Parr's All England eleven graced the town with their presence to compete against the Burnley Cricket Club. It was a monumental occasion, for the first time, a team of such celebrated cricketers had visited Burnley. In preparation, a grandstand was erected near the entrance on Brunshaw Road. Adding to the spectacle, the band of the Inniskillen Dragoons from Manchester was present, playing both teams onto the pitch. Another red-letter day for the club occurred a decade later, in 1878, when an Australian eleven visited Turf Moor. The odds seemed stacked against Burnley, who were up against legendary figures like Fred Spofforth, known as the Demon Bowler, Henry Boyle, and William Murdoch, the celebrated batsman. However, a combination of inclement weather and perhaps a bit of luck tilted the scales in favor of Burnley, resulting in a surprising but much celebrated draw. Two years after their initial visit, the Australians returned to Turf Moor for a three-day match against Burnley and District. This time, the visitors were in top form and secured a victory by the end of the second day. The event drew thousands of spectators, 
netting the Burnley club a financial windfall of £37. Around the same period, the club invested in a new pavilion costing nearly £500. The committee, eager to make Turf Moor a hub for various sports, founded a football club in 1874. Whether this football club later merged with Burnley Rovers to become the Burnley Football Club in 1882 remains a matter of speculation. Adding intrigue to the mystery was a game played at Turf Moor in 1878 featuring a Burnley team, and the overlapping committee memberships between the football and cricket clubs. Notable figures like Charles Sutcliffe were involved in both sports organisations. In a further diversification of its sporting portfolio, the club established a bowling green in 1875 at a cost of £234 and inaugurated a lawn tennis club in 1880. Both sports continued to be fixtures at Turf Moor for many years to come. In a generous gesture in 1882, Colonel Arthur Dugdale of the Queen's own Oxfordshire Hussars, a Burnley expat from the prominent Dugdale family, donated a wooden pavilion, also referred to as a summer house, for use with the bowling green. In April 1882, Turf Moor was the venue for the Lancashire Cup final between Blackburn Rovers and Accrington. The event was a smashing success, drawing a crowd of over 5,000 spectators. Interestingly, this means Blackburn Rovers played at Turf Moor before Burnley FC was even established, as the football club's formation came a month after this cup final. The success of the match likely influenced the cricket committee's decision to sponsor the formation of Burnley Football Club. By January 1883, the cricket club had purchased seven acres of land adjacent to their existing field from Behold Colliery and leased it to the new football team. They also contributed £65, roughly equivalent to £7,000 in 2023, toward initial setup costs. Thus, one could argue that Blackburn Rovers indirectly played a role in the birth of Burnley Football Club and its turf more location. Mr. Charles Sutcliffe, whose own history was tightly knitted into the fabric of both Burnley Football Club, its precursor, Burnley Rovers Rugby Club and Burnley Cricket Club was asked to play a pivotal role in spearheading the negotiations that led to Burnley FC making Turf Moor their home. His dual roles, as both player and negotiator, symbolised the intertwining of sport and the local community during that period. In the same year, the Cricket Club acquired and relocated a large pavilion from Palace House, for the mutual use of cricket and football players at a cost of £60. However, tensions surfaced by 1885 when cricketers complained that footballers were leaving the shared dressing room in a mess and not contributing to repair costs. This culminated in 1889 when Burnley FC decided to separate from the cricket club and agreed to pay an annual rent of £77 for the stadium. In 1886, a permanent grandstand and pavilion were constructed at Turf Moor, situated closer to the Belvedere roadside of the ground than the current pavilion. Fast forward to July 1890, when Turf Moor hosted a unique two-day cricket match featuring women's teams, comprising players from Surrey, Kent, and Middlesex, the teams, identified as red and blue, competed in outfits consisting of shin-high flannel skirts, high white boots, and open-collared sailor tops. To prevent their skirts from billowing too much, they were weighted down with shot. The event was a major draw, attracting thousands of spectators and generating over £200 in receipts. In conclusion, the rich tapestry of Burnley's sporting history is woven with remarkable figures, key events, and serendipitous decisions that shaped its present-day landscape. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe for more content like this in the future.